All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first sake tasting. We're really excited for you all to be here. And uh, we have some really exciting sakis to taste today. We'll have a selection of four. And we have two hosts. Uh, we have uh, Kayoko Abe, who is the brand ambassador for Izumibashi and founder and president of MU Gen uh, Inc. And then we also have Sarah, who is a sake at Saki educator for Eastern USA with Saki School of America. And they have a very exciting presentation and informative presentation with a great tasting plan ahead for us. So let's get started. Thank you, Jackie. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Izumibashi Tasting. And I'm very excited. And my name is Kayoko Abe. I'm the brand ambassador of Izumibashi. And uh, I'm a DC local, and uh, our company, Sake Mugen, is spreading Izumibashi sake and Japanese sake throughout the world from Washington, DC. And my family background, Wagashi, Japanese confectionery company with 150 years old history. I was trained to taste food, and so I have a very good food pairing skills without any knowledge. And uh, let me introduce, uh, hold on. Let me introduce um, Izumibashi president, Mr. Yuichi Hashiba. He's a sixth generation president. The Izumibashi has 160 years of rich history of uh, sake making and rice farming. After he took over his family business. He traveled to France and uh, other wineries so many times, and he learned wine making with uh, estate grown grapes. By that time, many sake breweries are not used to estate grown rice or never grown rice. And uh, they are purchasing rice from contracted farmers. He decided to return to the brewery's loot as a cultivation sake brewery. After this presentation, I hope you will learn about Izumibashi's world and uh, Japanese sake tonight. I will pass to my excellent partner, sake, uh, Sala Gutenberg, and from Izumibashi's uh, US importers company, Mutual Trading in New York. Okay, Sala. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Guderbach, and uh, I am a, a big nerd about wine and sake. Um, I just have this slide to introduce uh, the various certifications that I've earned over my over 20 years in food and beverage. I like to joke around that if you mix up the letters after my name, it spells cork dork. So that's the most that you need to know about me, um, but I am a wonderful, um, passionate uh, Passionista about sake. I have been working with the importer for Izumibashi for uh, about two years now. And I'm truly, um, as a wine lover, exceedingly excited to present this particular brand to you because uh, there are some amazing similarities about the way that Izumibashi is produced and some of the most uh, phenomenal and highly coveted wines in the world. So you're really in for a treat tonight. Next, Kyle Sang. Okay. So really quickly, uh, you have received four sakes to try. Uh, and we want to emphasize to everyone uh, that sake is meant to be sipped like a fine wine. Uh, even though many times you may go to restaurants and you're served sake in a small cup, uh, those are not shot glasses. Those are small cups that are meant to enjoy sake in small sips. Uh, next, Kyle Song. Uh, so we are hoping that you're enjoying the sake tonight in a wine glass in order to really enhance the aroma. This is actually a, a trend that has been uh, occurring in Japan for many, many years uh, since these more uh, important styles of sake were first perfected and became popular in the 80s. Uh, and I also just want to note um, that you're going to be tasting some of the sakes more than once tonight. So please taste uh, small amounts 
Uh, we'll start with a little kampai with the blue bottle uh, and uh, the rest um, just you know maybe reserve a little bit so that you can taste through them in detail with Kaiosan. And then if you happen to have products of uh, food to taste, uh, we'd like you to reserve some for the end to try with the food as well. One last really quick note before we move on. All of the sakes are available uh, for you tonight at very special prices, but they are highly limited. And one of them, the black label, the black dragonfly, uh, is currently still on its way to us from Japan. Uh, so um, please be patient. We hope that you'll uh, all order and enjoy these sakes at home. Um, but just note that the um, black dragonfly um, may take a few weeks before it's available uh, for you to pick up. Go ahead, Kyle Song. Okay. So I'm going to explain about a little bit about the hanami before we toast kanpai. So that, uh, as you know, that uh, the sakura cherry blossom tree is a very famous, and we brought uh, you brought from Japan Tokyo as a friendship, and uh, sakura is the Japanese name of a cherry blossom, and the sa meaning. Is, there's uh, so many that uh, meaning for the sakura, and uh, one of the leading uh, theory is that sa stands uh, sagami, meaning the god of rice paddy, and the kura stands for the pedestal, meaning tree. So the cherry blossom has been the use for the farming guide. For we we didn't have any. <laughs> or I watch. <laughs> so anyway, and uh, so they are praying for their God harvest under the cherry blossom tree and uh, the flowers bloomed as a hanami in the ancient time about uh, 1,300 years ago, the Japanese emperor started enjoying about the hanami watching the cherry blossom tree under the cherry blossom tree and having the some the picnic style and eating and drinking sake and also the no, uh, no novelties they are also doing so to spread uh, all over the japan but uh, after um after the samurai period all japanese everybody enjoyed the sakura cherry blossom tree as a hanami so the, for the toast, we call kampai and holding the sake cup. And uh, the kampai is a meaning for the everyone's good health and happy occasion. And uh, the, in the samurai period, world, uh, world, world, world laws made a toast to pray their victory in the battle. And so we are going to toast with everybody happiness and uh, having uh, so many good uh, prosperity and a uh, good occasion for future. So please hold your grass or any kind of grass or like, you know, grass, whatever. And uh, just, uh, you know, put higher and say that everybody say together, kampai, okay? Hold your grass. And uh, if you can unmute everybody and we can say the kampai. Lady? Yes. Okay. So maybe come by. Bye. Bye. Okay, so um, now that everybody has a little something in your glass, and I'll uh, invite you please to enjoy the blue bottle as uh, we speak a little bit more in detail about sake. Um, I'd like to just explain what is sake, what is it made from, what is the process here. So um, we should all hopefully know and understand that sake is a national beverage of Japan uh, and it is made from rice. Um, but it is neither a rice wine or a rice beer. Sometimes people call it rice wine. Uh, and this is a bit of a misnomer. Um, sake itself is actually its own category of beverage, and this has to do with how it's made. There are four main primary ingredients that are used to make sake, most importantly, obviously, being the rice. It's important to note that the type of rice that's used to make sake is different than table rice. 
Uh, so many of you, I'm sure, have eaten rice before in Asian restaurants, and you're maybe used to seeing sort of short, uh, narrow grains of rice. But you'll notice as you see these images, even the rice in the top uh, sort of middle section here of this slide looks more round. Um, the the uh, rice that is used to make sake has been specially uh, curated for special attributes that help it to produce uh, sake. Uh, and in particular, isolating certain types of aromas. Um, the rice itself is also suitable for polishing, which is important uh, to the final style of the sake. So we'll explain a little bit more about the polishing and its connection to the grade as well. Um, sake is also made with an ingredient called koji, which is a microorganism that's very important to breaking down uh, the starch in the rice into a fermentable sugar. So if you uh, were to imagine um, starch is a complex carbohydrate. When we eat rice, it tastes bland um, because we are, our tongue can't actually taste complex carbohydrates. When the complex carbohydrates are broken down into simple sugars like glucose, then it tastes sweet. So we have to utilize a microorganism like koji to break down this starch into smaller pieces. Not only are those complex carbohydrate molecules too large for our tongue to taste, they are too large for a little yeast to actually eat and produce alcohol. So koji is absolutely instrumental. It's actually the national mold of Japan, if you can believe it. It's used to make soy sauce. It's used to make miso. So you've probably had a lot of contact with koji and not, all, not had any idea before now. Uh, water is extremely important for sake production. It has a lot of uh, connection to the regional qualities of the sake. Uh, the water in Japan as a whole is very soft by comparison to the majority of the water uh, that comes out of your tap in the United States. So the spectrum of hardness of water in uh, Japan is very narrow and it generally is very, very soft. Japan is a big, long volcanic archipelago of islands. There are portions of Japan that get over 80 inches of rain per year. So just to put that in perspective, there's nowhere in the United States that gets that much rain, in the continental United States, I should say. So we imagine places like Seattle as being very wet. They get about 43 inches of rain per year. One third of Japan gets more than 80 inches of rain per year. And this is what contributes to this incredible, abundant, soft, pure, fresh water uh, that makes the sake so delicious. Yeast is, of course, incredibly important. And the yeast that's used to make sake is very special. It's in the same family of yeast that we would make wine from, uh, but the yeast has to be very strong because you'll see it says alcohol is less than 22%, but sake can actually ferment up to and over 20% alcohol by volume naturally without any distillation. And this has to do with the special process uh, by which it's made. I will also comment that the yeasts that are used to make sake are very important to creating distinctive aromas in the sake. So when we think about the rice as a pure ingredient, um, I'm sure many of you are wine lovers, we can take for granted that there are very different dynamic, uh, specific varietal differences between grapes. So we know, for instance, that Pinot Noir makes a very different style of wine than say Cabernet Sauvignon. Those differences between the rice types are not quite as dramatic in sake production. What has the greatest impact is how much that rice is actually polished and of course the yeast selection. Um, all of these things work together to create the different ar aromatic qualities that we notice in sake styles. Go ahead next, uh, Kaiosan. So this uh, is my joke slide, Simple Sake 101. Uh, the only reason that I have this here is to show you all of the stars on this slide. Um, the main thing to take away from this is you'll notice that pretty much every single step uh, has a star by it. The red stars are wholly and completely optional. The purple stars are highly variable. And the reason why I think it's important to note this is because 
This is why there aren't a lot of very clear black and white answers about sake. The clearest thing I can tell you is that yes, it's made from rice, but the differences in the sakes are dramatically different based on the producers and their decisions. Kaiosan, you can go next. We'll show them a little bit more in detail. So just to kind of um, break down the actual sake production process for you. Um, the, um, we start with rice uh, cultivation here in the top area here. And of course we have beautiful dragonflies living in these healthy rice paddies. Uh, which are, of course, the signature of Izumibashi. Um, but rice cultivation um, is a very a difficult process, a very interesting. Um, and it's important to note that rice, just like grapes, um, have a vintage. Um, it is produced annually. I also think it's important, as I mentioned, the rice types for sake are very different than the rice that's used to make uh, for table rice. So the type of rice that's used to make uh, sake uh, is much harder to grow. Um, it has a much longer growing cycle. Uh, and it also makes these larger round fat grains. So Kaiosan is pointing out here that these grains have what's called a shinpaku, so white heart, a center of a very highly concentrated starch in the middle. So these starch, these rice grains are then going to be polished uh, and the idea uh, is to remove some of the outer layers of the uh, grain and get down to the center where there's purely starch. So technically in these grains of rice, there is starch throughout, uh, but in the outer grains, there are proteins, vitamins, minerals, lipids, and fatty acids, which can invigorate yeast and result in some unusual flavors in the sake that aren't always appealing. Uh, the high amount of protein in the outer layers of the rice actually will create um, higher and higher amounts of glutamic acids um, and uh, amino acids. So the more you polish the rice, the more you get to this pure starch, uh, the pure starch becomes pure glucose, pure glucose becomes pure alcohol, hooray, very important ingredient. And uh, this in results then with the more that you polish the rice, the more pure and bright the flavors are of the sake. So we'll talk more about that as well. The rice after it's polished um, has a lot of dust on it, which has to be washed away. So they then will um, you know, go ahead and um, uh, take away uh, these outer powder by washing it. They also soak the rice at this time. Um, and this is very helpful uh, for the steaming process. Steaming the rice um, helps to gelatinize the starch that's in the center of the rice. And what that means is that it actually helps to expand the molecules of glucose, making it easier for the, co the Koji enzymes in future to break them down into individual pieces. So you then see this uh, Koji rice production here. Um, this is a separate step where a portion of the steam rice is then taken uh, to uh, a separate room where it's inoculated with these little spores of the koji mold, which grow on each piece of rice. Again, the koji is what produces the diastic enzymes that break down the starch into glucose. So without koji, there would be no uh, sake. There would be no glucose for the uh, uh, yeast to eat. This a portion of the koji is then taken along with more steamed rice and water to create what's called a yeast starter. We call this shubo or moto, the mother of sake. So this is kind of a fascinating thing to note here that we start by building a strong fermentation in a separate small batch when we make sake. So if you compare this, let's say to rice, or excuse me, just to wine production, um, you know, with wine, they, they crush up a bunch of grapes. They have a big vat filled with sweet liquid and they, they pitch the yeast on the top. With sake, they actually build a strong population of yeast at the bottom of the tank and then build up over a, few, a period of days to fill up the tank and create this strong fermentation. This stage here is called the moromi. And the fermentation itself generally lasts for high quality sake for anywhere from four to six weeks. So it's a very long temperature controlled process. 
after this is done, we have a whole bunch of rice and yeast uh, still floating around in this tank. It looks a lot like um, pancake batter to me or buttermilk. It's kind of a gloopy white mess. Uh, so we have to remove the bits of rice and all of this floating around. It's called the sake lees or kasu. It has to be removed. So we do this through a special pressing technique. The clear sake comes out of the press. Again, very similar to pressing uh, the wine, uh, the red wine out from the skins when you're finished. Uh, the, the sake is then going to be stored for a while in tanks and then later bottled. So that's sort of a nutshell uh, how sake is produced. Oh, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to just give you an illustration of how the fermentation works. This is called multiple parallel fermentation. The Japanese term is heiko fukohako, one of the longest uh, terms I've ever had to learn uh, for any type of fermentation process. But what you see here is you have an individual piece of rice with all of these little spores of koji growing in. The koji actually finds the starchy center of the rice and says, oh, this is an energy source for me to live on. So I'm gonna burrow into the rice and I'm gonna break down the starch into glucose so I can live. We don't actually want the koji to live on the rice long enough in order to act for it to actually develop a moldy taste. So um, after about 48 hours of um, meticulous work, uh, we stop the growth of the koji mold. And, we, uh, we, and when you taste this rice at this time, you can taste the sweetness. It's really very delicious. Um, it tastes a little bit like, um, almost like Rice Krispies to me, um, or a little bit like a marzipan or chestnut paste. So this sweet rice then is filled with this fermentable sugar that the yeast can eat and multiply and produce alcohol. So this is very, very unique because essentially you have these two processes, two microorganisms working together in the same tank in parallel. So at the same time that koji is breaking down the starch into glucose, the yeast is eating that starch and producing alcohol. The yeast essentially never really run out of food, which is how sake can ferment up to about 20 or percent uh, alcohol by volume or higher. Next. So just to break this down, um, there's a very different uh, characteristic of alcohol by volume in different alcoholic beverages. So on the left, you have a uh, uh, products that are brewed or um, fermented, naturally fermented process. Uh, and on the right, you have items that are distilled spirits. Uh, so in order to make a distilled spirit, you have to start with a base alcohol. So if you were to take the beer on the left and you were the, to then distill it, you would have whiskey, which you see on the right, which is you know going to be fermented or, or distilled up to, you know, maybe up to even, you know, 80% alcohol by volume or higher, and then diluted back to say 40% alcohol before it is uh, released. We also have an image here of shochu. Um, one of the very famous types of shochu uh, that's available in Japan is actually distilled from uh, sake or distilled from uh, the lees, the pressings from making the sake. Uh, and this is a single distillation, distillation process um, usually a much lower alcohol by volume uh, and, and much less um, dilution. So really delicious um, product for your future. But what I wanted to point out is that beer, champagne, and wine are all produced um, by creating or naturally having sugar already existing. So with beer, you know, they uh, will germinate the barley and then they will uh, cook that barley in a, in a mash in order to release the sugar. Um, that sweet wort will then have yeast added to it and it can ferment up to the amount of alcohol available based on the amount of sugar there. So most beer only ferments up to about 6% alcohol. In order to make a high gravity beer, you have to add extra ingredients. With wine, we harvest the grapes at the appropriate uh, time. Um, when we talk about that often in terms of bricks or balm, uh, balm is the potential alcohol, same as bricks. If you, if you were to uh, harvest grapes in France at 14 balm, you would have 14% alcohol when you're done. 
What's really unique here to understand is that with sake, again, they are not, um, there, there's never really a proper measure of potential alcohol uh, in this production because the sugar is being created at the same time that fermentation is happening. So it's a super interesting process when you put it in perspective that that's a whole element that the uh, toji or the brewmaster has to control is how the sugar is released um, by, by creating the proper type of koji, the proper type of conditions, they control how much sugar is slowly released into the batch over time. And they have special techniques to stop that fermentation at the end, landing at the appropriate level of alcohol by volume. And then generally sake is going to be diluted uh, just a little bit to make it a little bit more palatable to be drunk through a meal. So we can go next. So I wanted to give you guys a bit of information about sake classifications. On the left side here, you have a pyramid uh, that shows you uh, the very top of the best styles of sake that are available. Uh, so this is a pyramid here that represents about 30% of sake produced in Japan. So you have to imagine this is kind of like the iceberg that hit the Titanic. There's a giant portion underneath of this um, uh, pyramid for what's called futsushu or ordinary sake. So about 70% of sake that's produced in Japan is sort of bulk produced sake for everyday drinking. This 30% that you see here in all of these categories is only about 30% of what's made in Japan. And we are very lucky in the, in the United States because even though this represents only 30% of sake produced, it represents about 98% of the sake that comes uh, to the United States. It's also really important to me to emphasize that the grades that you see here, you'll see there's two sides of the pyramid, Junmai, Tokubetsu Junmai, Junmai Ginjo, Junmai Dai Ginjo, then you have Honjozo, Tokubetsu Honjozo, Ginjo Dai Ginjo. These grades indicate style, but not necessarily quality. Uh, there are very, very good quality types of Junmai or Honjozo Shu. There are some Dai Ginjo Sakes that are acceptable, but not outstanding. What we use this for is to help us understand in part also the quantity. So the very least amount of sake made in Japan is in the Dai Ginjo grade. It's about six or 7% of all sake produced. So you're going to taste some extremely rare sake indeed today. You can go ahead and click next. So the way that these classifications come together have to do with uh, how much the rice is polished before it is produced into sake and whether or not any alcohol might be added um, to the brew. Um, the really good news is that these terms are fixed. They're not combined. So thank goodness there's no such thing as Junmai Daiginjo Tokubetsu Honjozo because that's too much for anybody to say. Uh, you'll just see one of these categories on the left or the right to give you an indication of style. Next. So the numeric percentages that you see uh, on the back of bottles and on text sheets have to do with how much rice remains after polishing. So Dai Ginjo grades, what you see here, these are basically the maximum amount of rice that can remain after polishing, but they can do more. So in order to qualify for Dai Ginjo, they have to take off at least 50% of the outside of the rice. In order to qualify for the Ginjo grades, and most tokubetsu grades, they have to take off at least 40%. For honjozo shu, they have to take off 30%. Uh, and these are the same across the board for all categories, except for junmai itself in the bottom left-hand corner here. This particular category is unique uh, because it, the sake has no added alcohol here. All they care about is that it be made with just four ingredients, rice, water, yeast, and koji. Um, for the honjozo shu on the right side, because you're adding a little bit of alcohol, they then add this extra quality check by insisting that the rice be polished uh, down to uh, 70%. So again, these are maximum amounts. Of, there are sakes that are polished far more. In fact, you'll be tasting a junmai daiginjo today. Uh, with far more polishing than only 50%. Next. So the main thing to note here is that the lower that the percentage is, in other words, the more rice they take off, the lighter and generally more fragrant and fruity the style of the sake. 
Uh, when you have higher numbers, you tend to have more ricey, uh, rich umami characteristics. So let's dial that in next. Oh, let me delete my little mark here. So um, junmai uh, means pure rice, no alcohol added. Next. The problem with junmai is that it's a proper noun as a category. Next. Uh, but it's also an adjective. So junmai is used to also describe daiginjo sakes, ginjo sakes, and special sakes that also have no added alcohol. So this gets to be a little confusing uh, for people. Next. The next really important term uh, to know um, is about ginjo. So just dialing this in here with junmai, if you don't see junmai on a label, it means that they have a little bit of added alcohol to the sake. And I'll just pause to comment on that, that a lot of people wonder, well, if the sake can ferment up to 20% alcohol by itself, why would you add a little extra alcohol? The reason is that occasionally brewers do this because alcohol is a solvent and it can be used at the end of the production process before the sake is pressed, before all of the rice is removed in order to extract more aromatic compounds from the rice. So that's why you have some categories that have a little added alcohol. Um, if you see junmai, it means no added alcohol. If you don't see junmai, they've added a little alcohol. Ginjo is a category of sakes. Um, you have Junmai Ginjo, Ginjo, Junmai Dai Ginjo, and Dai Ginjo. And Ginjo itself means specialized brewing. Next. Uh, dai Ginjo is a subset here that means highly specialized brewing. The idea here is that these are the sakes that are made usually almost invariably by hand, all hand making techniques, highly polished rice. And the result is a more fruity, fragrant style of sake. Next, kayo -san. So ginjo sakes tend to have floral and fruity characteristics. If you like fruity and floral wines, you're probably going to like sakes that have ginjo in the name as well. Next. So these are the arom aromatic characteristics associated with ginjo and dai ginjo sakes. And you'll notice lots of tropical and orchard fruits here. Um, again, if you don't see ginjo on the label, it should be a more savory style of sake. Next, again, if you like fruitier beverages, look for ginjo on the label. Next. And I think it's time to taste again in more detail. So I'll let Kayo-san step in here for that. Okay, so please um, be ready to drink that uh, our gold bottle. And uh, this bottle is our top line of the uh, US uh, setting. That, uh, and uh, gold dragon, dragonfly Kimoto. Dragonfly is our company logo and uh, the symbol of the, the uh, the press and the good luck because the dragonfly is flying only the forward, not going backwards. So it's a braveness. And also they keep watching that the rice paddy to avoid any other harmful insect. And they live all year long because winter time, even still in the rice paddy underneath, there is an egg. And uh, so that uh, this is uh, the symbol of the life cycle, natural life cycle. And the dragon, um, this gold bottle called Kimoto, um, Sara is going to discuss later on and 35 meaning the life polishing she just uh, mentioned about. So they grinded the remains that the 35%. So the 65% they grinded right off. So it's a very, very precious bottle. And uh, so first of all, you sip. And uh, when you are sipping, it's not like uh, that uh, shot glass as uh, Sala mentioned it. And please, you know, drink a mouthful and enjoy the aroma first in uh, your mouth through the nose and then slowly drink it into your you know, uh, the throat. 
and after, you will enjoy the after nozzle, like come up to your nose, because usually that the wine is stays the after nozzle is a 30 second, but uh, normally that the Japanese sake is stay more than one, one minute in your nose, in your mouth. And so then you are ready to have the, some kind of the food. And uh, some of the uh, people, they, uh, you, you purchase uh, the ham or prosciutto ham or cheese. So this is a very precious and very light taste. And also that the uh, sake rice is um, the lakufu mai. And this is a newest rice in, in Japan. And uh, Izumibashi is a rice grower. The estate grown uh, Lakuhumai is uh, registered and uh, they are making 100% estate grown Lakuhumai for this bottle. And they won several the, the prestige sake competition in uh, France and London and also San Francisco. And uh, also that the previous, that the prime minister brought this bottle to the White House as a gift from Japan. And they selected this bottle as a, to the White House. Unfortunately, I think I heard that Joe Biden, uh, he is not drinking any alcohol, but hopefully somebody was drinking this bottle. So anyway, um, you realize that this is a very, uh, um, the gorgeous aroma compared to other bottle, and they have a mascot and melons and the faint sweetness you can detect and uh, have uh, the lakufu my sake rice has uh, a lot of acidity and uh, so you can uh, the, have the good combination of the sourness and umami and sweetness. And so I will suggest have a little fatty food like you know the hams and prosciutto hams, or have like vinaigrette the dishes or like you know sashimi or sushi or like uh, the ceviche sea, uh, seafood and ahijo from the Spain, and uh, so you will enjoy any kind of combination with this bottle. Okay. The next one, we can start shipping that uh, blue bottle. This is our signature bottle and using Yamada Nishiki, that's the sake rice, is the most popular and many brewery using for the sake competition. And uh, the Yamada Nishiki is also, the Izumibashi is a registered farmer in Kanagawa prefecture. I will show you the map where the brewery located, but uh, the Mr. Hashiba, so this is the signature bottle for the brewery. And uh, this is a uh, dry and uh, Junmai, uh, Junmai Ginjo. And uh, they got the, uh, um, they got uh, the Kura Master in uh, 2020 gold price and uh, dry, but uh, also have a very um, palate cleansing that the uh, umami and bitterness and sweetness balanced. So usually we use like sushi or seafood again because of the ginjo flavor as Sala mentioned about it. And uh, you will enjoy with that, uh, some, that, uh, the milky cheese or uh, even like uh, their burgers or pizza with this. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about more about the Izumibashi. They are located, and here is a Tokyo, and it's a next to called Kanagawa Prefecture. And there are Izumibashi located Ebina City in Kanagawa Prefecture. So about a one hour train ride from the center of Tokyo. And here is the brewery's uh, rice party. And here is the breweries. And there is a Tanza Mountains. So that the water and the source for this rice party, it was so beautiful. And uh, they have uh, more than 2000 years uh, rice party, rice cultivation history. They have a very rich soil from the, the mountain that the water and from the river. And so there, there are, they have a several, several different location in the around the, this brewery and have a lot light, light party field. 
So I want to show you, there were um, interviewed by CNBC talking about uh, rice cultivation. This man is part of literally a dying breed. The Japanese farmer, like his father, grandfather, and great grandfather, sorry, rice in Ebina, a sleep hmm? suburb 50 kilometers outside of Tokyo, but not just on his own land. <laughs> Ikigami tells me that many farmers who left the industry let him farm their land for free because they'd have to pay tax if they left their fields fallow. Ikigami is one of Japan's modern day sharecroppers. He leads a cooperative of other people like himself who are helping to keep farmers and farming alive. Since 1990, the number of farmers in Japan has more than halved. Most are 65 or older. Their children don't want to do the same kind of work. They prefer city jobs. So farmers are in short supply and more expensive to hire. Labor and land, which has always been expensive in Japan, are still the biggest costs in farming. Ikigami's cooperative gets around both problems. They farm other people's land, pay no rent, and keep everything they grow. Win-win for farmers and landowners. Half of their crop goes to people making bento lunchboxes. The other half goes to the man who started the cooperative 20 years ago. Yuchi Hashiba, who's keeping his family's tradition of brewing sake alive. Hashiba tells me the cooperative was his answer to the crisis in Japanese farming. He gets almost all of his rice, the main ingredient in making sake, from the cooperative in Ebina and the region nearby. He says it's much cheaper than trucking it in from further away and gives him more control over the quality of the rice an asset-like business model and a virtuous circle that's made Hashiba as well as Ikegami very successful. You know, it's true that in general, farming is a hard and dying way of making a living here in Japan. But with the right place, the right time, the right people and the right ideas, Ikegami-san and his other farmers at the cooperative have become so successful, they're starting to steadily buy up real estate in the area. For centuries, rice has been an almost sacred part of Japan's culture. Today, though, Japanese are eating less rice than ever before. Partly changing tastes, partly demographics, a shrinking population, which makes farming more challenging than ever, despite rare success stories like Ikigami and Hashibas. So I want to talk about more the averted point about Izumi, Izumiwashi. Uh, how special compared to other sake breweries. Um, the rice farming, yes, that uh, they are doing that uh, estate grown rice, this is uh, less than 10%. So tonight the keyword is less than 10%. So the other brewery, usually they buy from the contracted farmer. And the rice portion, as I said, that uh, they have a own site machine, which is also layer less than 10% brewery does that. And uh, the most of the have the uh, outsourced and the koji making. And oh, sorry, that the rice portion also, they are choose to do the flat rice, flat shape rice portion, which is the most of the technical, requires the technical skills than that round shape of, um, portion. And they have a koji lead and also they are making that by hand is the traditional way. Takes more time to do so compared to the machine. And uh, also for the East starter, they use a kimoto and takes more, more time than the, the sokujo, the modern East first, uh, the East starter. And the pressing, the funa press, is they are doing the traditional pressing method that takes one day compared to the machine press takes three hours. And also I didn't include the one other thing so that they all own the company restaurant because Mr. Hashiba believes that their sake was more towards to the parents 
that the food pairings, not, not um, drinking the soul. And uh, so they are, they are trying to explain how to pair with the food demonstrating at their company restaurant. Uh, sorry, I'm mute, I'm mute. Thank you. Um, I've been adding some notes in the chat. Um, if you haven't been reading along, you can check it out um, just to add some additional anecdotes to what Kyle san has been saying. But I think that what's really interesting here to consider with this particular brewery and what makes it so unique and special is that um, it is essentially like saying a state grown and bottled on a wine label. Uh, even more accurately, it's like a grower producer for champagne. So many of you may be familiar that most big champagne houses buy grapes from many, many different um, uh, growers, and they also will buy finished wine uh, that they will then blend into their final uh, products. Uh, it's pretty rare to find producers in Champagne that grow all of their own grapes themselves, make the base wines, and make it into Champagne all by hand by themselves. So uh, Zubibashi belongs in that same family of very limited selections. Um, it's extremely rare and very special. Next one, uh, I'm going to explain because of that, uh, we uh, the Izumibashi was also care about the environment, and especially uh, they are doing the. It's also very rare for the as a sake brewery that those kind of the sustainable farming, and uh, so first of all the rice body, yes they are doing that uh, the rice grow um the cultivation, and they are. Uh, not using a pesticides and uh, also trying to you know maintain that the uh, highest quality of the rice um rice and uh, grow and uh, the next one is the husks so the rice and the perishing and there is a grinding process maybe some of uh, you just uh, wonder when that the gold bottle the the grind and uh, the perishing a uh, lead of 65% of the lice. And so those uh, we call komenuka brain goes to two part. One is they are using for making a lice bread. Like, you know, they have a very beautiful, we call kare pan. So kare pan meaning that the kari, a kari, Japanese style kare inside, and there is a, like fried uh, the bread. So this one, they got the award winning the, the prize at the local the restaurant. And the other one is compost. They are using the, the brain and fermented into the rice paddy and making a very good fertilizer. It's a natural, so they are not using it, chemicals. So then go to the rice uh, paddy to the next season. So the next one is sustainable sake making. So once they are polishing rice, and then the process Sarah explained about you know making a sake mash that the moromi he, he there's a huge tank so the worker the brewery worker is mixing up, and um, then they have the sake leaves, and then they press, and after the sake leaves they are using the shochu making called sak sa, uh, saka uh, kastori shochu. And after they use uh, the lease and uh, left that uh, this uh, lease, and this one goes to the chicken farm, and they are making a uh, food for chickens. And first of all, they have a lot of like sweetness and the minerals and the vitamins, and they found uh, fermented and uh, convert to the chicken food. And then chicken got a very healthy food and uh, they are very active and not in the caged. And so everything is natural and they produce an egg. So the, the egg is a very costly one and about a hundred, uh, uh, about 200 US dollar per egg, not a dozen. And uh, goes to the company restaurant and they use the uh, egg. So we, the Izumiwashi trying to use everything they can and to maintain the, their environment friendly um, style for sake making. So the, 
uh, Sarah, are you going with the explain? Oh, sure. Yeah. So this is just some images from the brewery here. Um, most importantly, to show you how everything truly is done by hand. A lot of brewers have automation for these processes. Um, the on the left here, you see um, that. Um, them working on making koji um, and they're making koji in these tiny little uh, trays are called lids. Um, you can see by comparison to the size of the hand, um, basically about a kilogram of rice alone will fit into each one of these boxes. Um, so it's extremely time consuming. If you imagine being concerned about every single grain of rice and making you know pans and pans and pans of that rice, um, we'll talk more about the uh, the yeast starter, the shubo, as we move forward. And you can see them uh, stirring up the main mash. Next. Um, I wanted to show you this. This is very special. This is an image here from the, um, the uh, of pressing the sake. So these bags, they're called sake bukuro. They're bags that uh, you fill with the uh, finished fermenting sake, which is filled with rice and yeast and koji. Um, again, as I mentioned, it looks kind of like pancake batter or buttermilk. They fill these bags with this moromi and these porous bags. They give them a quick little flip. There's like a little special fold and they lay them down inside of this press called the fune. Fune means boat in Japanese. And the gravity of the bags itself starts to allow the clear sake to seep through. And then eventually they'll add a little bit of gentle pressure to press out the rest of the sake. Um, but this is a very a special hand done technique for pressing the sake. And it's a way for just like with champagne pressing uh, that they're able to capture the very best of what comes out of the press to use for bottling. Next. So talking about the Shubo, the mother of sake, uh, this is again, go ahead, uh, you can fill this slide up um, if you'd like, uh, Kyle-san, yeah. So yeast again is the yeast, or the Shubo is the yeast starter. Um, shubo and Moto are uh, interchangeable words for the same thing. Uh, the idea here for creating a, a, a yeast starter is to have a really strong, active environment of yeast that you will then build a larger tank of uh, fermenting sake on top of. Part of this is to allow lactic acid to either build or be added uh, to keep other spoilage microorganisms uh, at bay. So the way that the yeast starter is made can affect the final acidity of the sake. There's a fast technique called sokujo moto that only takes about two weeks that about 90% of brewers use. And there's a traditional method called the Kimoto method that takes about four weeks. Uh, and this is one of the specialties of Izumi Bashi, the Kimoto technique. Next. So just to show you the history of uh, shubo making. So uh, going back to the Edo period, the Kimoto process was perfected. And again, it takes about four weeks of time. Uh, in this process, uh, they, at the time, it's important to note that Japan had its doors closed to uh, Western society. They didn't open their doors until 1853. So they didn't have a lot of science uh, and microbiology to prove what they were seeing that was happening. But the uh, Toji would pass down to each successor this technique of noticing that if you mix Koji rice, rice and water up with paddles over hours of time, eventually fermentation would begin. Once uh, Japan opened, it, opened its doors and all of the study of microbiology came in, uh, the National uh, Research Institute of Brewing in Hiroshima uh, began to do studies sort of figuring out what was actually going on. So go ahead and hit next. Uh, in 1909, they realized, okay, well, the lactic acid bacteria are ambient. They're getting in here by themselves. Maybe we don't have to stir up all of these buckets with all of this manual labor. If we just wait for it, lactic acid is going to build naturally and then the yeast will have a very nice environment. Next, uh, the very next year in 2010, they said, well, why are we waiting for four weeks for this and inviting this opportunity for everything to go bad? We can just add lactic acid uh, and speed up the process. So this fast method, Sokujomoto, was uh, became an official process in 1910. 
Uh, but there are still a handful of breweries like Izumigashi that practice this traditional technique. And there's some reasons why. Next. Um, so here's it, the image of what it looks like of this laborious pounding with poles that they do to make the starter in the Kimoto process. So these are guys stirring up yeast, I'm sorry, um, uh, koji rice, rice and water in these buckets. Uh, and it's slowly allowing ambient lactic acid bacteria to grow in there. At the back of the room, we put a little star just to show you this is one of the uh, presses uh, that they have at the brewery. So you saw inside where those bags go in. This is what that looks like from the outside or one of them looks like from the outside. Next. So just to give you some additional reasons why here. So the Sokujo Moto, uh, the fast method for about 90% of sake is very reliable. It's easily controlled and makes very light, clean style sake. Um, but the Kimoto process, this where you're mixing up with the poles, um, really creates higher acidity and more complex sake. So go ahead and fill up the side, uh, Kaiosan. So again, only 10% of sakes are done this way. And it is a very difficult process to perfect. If you don't do it right, you can lose everything. It can all go bad. Uh, generally speaking, there's more notable uh, acidity in the sake and there's much more savory umami. Many of these sakes can benefit from being warmed. Uh, and I will say there are many people in the world who would agree that uh, Kimoto style sakes are among the most complex sakes in the world. Uh, they also are often more uh, benefit from aging. Go ahead, Kyle Song. Okay, so that, uh, our another the, the Kimoto, the signature bottle for the Kimoto style Junmai, and uh, we call nickname the dragon, uh, black dragon, uh, dragonfly Kimoto Junmai, two year aged. So this bottle was uh, after the the, the uh, farming, uh, the pressing, and they put that uh, in a cold kept it cold temperature in for two more than two years and then them bottled. And so that the uh, Kimoto style, as I said, that, uh, you know, there are so many layers like, you know, that the uh, full body type of red wine. And this one is particular, which is my favorite bottle. And uh, um, the Japanese sake is such a unique, you can change the, the, the temperature, you can warm up. So I made a slide that uh, the chart with the, the several pairing suggestion with uh, using a cheese and the ham and the pickles at the store. And uh, so especially with Kimoto style sake is a very good warm sake. Even, you know, I suggest that you can try that the Junmai Daiginjo style sake with Kimoto don't scare and you can warm up a little bit like you know start if you don't have a some uh, some matter and just warm up and compare with your body temperature to start and uh, just you know boiling that hot uh, hot water in the pan and putting that the the, the pilex the grass cup and pour that the sake and warm up a little bit and then you know take out and uh, my suggestion is just to start doing that uh, body temperature, you know, the lab, uh, level. So anyway, back to the black dragonfly, this bottle. This is has a Kimoto has a, the a lactic acid process. So meaning there are so many that the acidity, especially this one has a very clean acidity and also milky taste. So when I uh, when I drank this in a bottle first, I thought it's called Kriya Yakut. So it's like a Japanese kid, uh, the probiotic or yogurt drink. And so it's like, you know, you can taste like yo yogurt and or like lassi taste drink, but it's still clear. And uh, they are very good with uh, the beef, lamb, or uh, like, you know, that uh, some that uh, they are, uh, Fat, uh, have the fattenings in the dish. So even like you know, the, the, a lot of umami, they're gonna pull out from the dish like oysters or a shellfish and uh, will be a good, you know, like, you know, very simple. You don't need to go to the, you know, the fancy restaurant, just buy the baguette. And also that uh, some like that uh, camembert cheese and uh, put it and uh, have the, uh, the 
with uh, the, maybe that the uh, scallop and uh, the, um, the sauteed and uh, will be a great match with uh, the, the umami combination with this bottle if you can warm up and uh, even the cold and room temperature is good. So next one, the last bottle I'm going to explain about umeshu that uh, some people call uh, the plum wine, but I prefer to call umeshu is a totally different than wine. And uh, this is, we use that uh, ume. Ume is a uh, very unique, cannot eat low. And uh, this ume we particularly use for the umeshu and it was locally grown called Odawara in Kanaga prefecture and uh, very close to the, um, um, the Hakone Onsen Place Hot Spring and uh, Odawara Ume, the brand name, variety name called Juro Ume. So the bottle name called Yamada Juro because we use the Junmai Daiginjo Sake and then used uh, the made by from Yamada Nishiki, that's uh, the most popular sake rice. And uh, so then no editing alcohol. So Junmai Daiginjo Umeshu. And uh, this is a uh, very unique taste and uh, have the sweetness and the ume has a very acidity taste. And uh, we use a pickled food called ume boshi and uh, with the, the rice bowl and the inside and we put the, the pickled, the fermented the ume as a ume, uh, ume boshi. And uh, so, once we made this one with the uh, Junmai Daiginjo and soaked the fresh green ume into the sake tank and uh, they aged and uh, this they take out. And they, this bottle was aged more than five years and they got the double point, gold, uh, double price, the gold price and uh, 70, at 97 point at the last November at the San Francisco International Competition. And uh, this one is has a very good smokiness and bitterness and also um, the sourness. So it's a very good combination. You can drink after the meal with dessert, even during the meal, because it's not too sweet, unlike other, you know, that the most uh, umeshu. And uh, this one is still you can drink during the meal. And uh, sometimes I make a cocktail with uh, like uh, the, uh, um, the smoky whiskey, one or two drop into the umeshu and heat up. And or sometimes add uh, more sweetness you are looking for. I add uh, the syrup and, uh, and it will be a good combination for that the maple syrup it will be a nice because the acid taste will come up. Kayo-san, yep. um, there's a question from um, Kevin mm -hmm. um, about the umeshu. Mm -hmm. um, is it fermented with plums or finished with plums? No, it's not uh, fermented, not like umeboshi, that the green plum um, the soaked in the Junmai Daiginjo tank. Yeah, so, so they, they are adding the plums to the Junmai Daiginjo tank and the presence of alcohol helps to extract yes. all of this. Yes. Uh, it's, from it's, it's a very hard, it's not like, you know, they, they're gonna be down like yellow to the more like orange and they make a very soft, but uh, you know, this, the green green is a very, very hard, uh, hard uh, that uh, uh, out, out layer. So they just soaked into the sake tank. Thank you, Kyle Song. Thank you. So next. So we're one. running a little bit short on time, yeah. but I'm going to zoom through really quick a little bit of science. Go ahead and fill up the slide, Kyle Song, okay. and I'll just talk about these points. Um, okay. So, oh, that. So um, the uh, science of beverage pairing um, is really the same, um, regardless of the beverage, but it has to do with the components of the beverage. 
So salt uh, in food uh, makes sake taste more fruity, just in the same way that it does with wine. Uh, it also reduces your impression of astringency and acidity. The most important part about salt, though, is that it enhances umami. We gave everybody a bag of uh, sea salt uh, kettle cooked potato chips because uh, we wanted you to have the opportunity to try the marriage of salty food with sake. Um, the magic of sake and sushi has a lot more to do with this, the um, salt in the soy sauce, the salinity of the soy sauce, as opposed to the actual fish and rice uh, that you are pairing it with. Uh, salt actually activates the amino acids that are in the uh, sake and enhances your impression of umami, the deliciousness of the sake. So we just recommend anything salty um, with sake. Next, you can go ahead and fill this up. Uh, I did want to make sure everybody understood what umami is. A lot of times there's some misunderstanding. Uh, some people will try to describe umami as an earthy character uh, because often we will discuss uh, the difference between a raw mushroom and a roasted mushroom. Raw mushroom tastes like fungus. Roasted mushrooms have rich, savory characteristics. But the truth is, is that umami can be very high in vine ripened tomatoes. It's very high in cured meats and aged cheeses. Uh, and I wouldn't describe a vine ripened tomato as uh, earthy. It has a spreading deliciousness, uh, this sensation. It's a message that is sent to the brain that tells you this is fantastically delicious and I want another bite. It is technically its own flavor enhancer. Next. So you can fill this up. So sake is very important to umami um, because sake has the highest level of amino acids, the building uh, blocks of umami of any other uh, food or beverage product really in the world. It has one of the most complex uh, characteristics of uh, glutamic acids. Uh, the and amino acids. What's hard about umami is that when you pair it with wine, it can often create an unpleasant taste. Sake, because it has so much of these same umami characteristics, actually enhances the umami in food. So rather than acting against umami like wine, sake actually enhances this. Um, it's interesting to note that lower grades of sake, uh, so like the black dragonfly as a junmai, has a whole lot of umami, um, even more umami than, let's say, um, the golden dragonfly that you tried earlier. Uh, the combinations of these amino acids with different foods can be absolutely fascinating. This is the main reason why Kaiosan recommended the cured meats and cheeses for you all to enjoy today. Next. Um, really quickly, just to comment about acidity because ume is extremely high in acid. Um, sake itself generally is very low in acid, much lower in acid than wine. Um, but the same thing bodes true with acidity as it does with wine in that the acidity of a food will mitigate the acidity of uh, the beverage. So sake being lower in acidity in general can actually enhance your impression of acidity in things like pickles. Uh, but if you were to go ahead and get the last click here, Kaiosan, um, when you think about uh, things like the umeshu being very high in acidity, it can actually be a fabulous palate cleanser and it can also be amazing with things that are pickled. Uh, so I highly recommend trying it um, with things like pickled onion and other enhancements uh, to uh, your dishes. So. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's not that. So I, I'm going to just, uh, maybe you already looked at the, 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 some pairing suggestions and uh, probably I'm going to, you know, you can take like, look at the later on with that uh, there are so many different cheese and milky teas and uh, different kind of cheese and uh, please try that, uh, you know, with your sense that, uh, you know, which one is good. And uh, sometimes that uh, or izumibashi bottle, you can warm up from that uh, different uh, the temperature 
and uh, will you know change that uh, even different temperature will show you the different characteristics. So please find out. And be, be, uh, I just curious, you know, how you feel, and please let me know that the, how what is the, your best combination sake and uh, the some the cheese and hams. And I just want to go quickly saying that there is just so many names with the temperature and uh, there are a variety of different kind of the naming and uh, you can um, that, uh, try to warm up. So please try to warm up sake. You will enjoy it. So Salah, the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just really quickly, we're often asked at the, uh, during these, uh, presentations. Um, how do I take care of my sake? How long can I drink my sake? Um, so a few things to note. Uh, sake is extremely sensitive to light and to heat. Um, so you want to make sure that you keep your sake in a cool place. Um, it's best to store the bottles upright. So unlike wine that's sealed with a cork that you have to keep in contact with moisture, you can keep the sake bottles with the screw caps or the tea tops upright, um, but you really want to avoid bright light and you want to avoid major fluctuations uh, in, in temperature. So I honestly often recommend to people that they keep their sake in their wine chiller uh, or, or cellar in the same way that you would your wine. Um, the other thing to note here is that sake is generally released ready to drink or at the optimum drinking uh, stage based on what the brewer wants for the consumer to enjoy. So sake is not generally uh, encouraged to be aged at home in your cellar. Um, it's not likely to always improve over time. Most brewers would recommend that you uh, enjoy your sake within at least the like you know, nine months to a year of purchasing that sake. That being said, What's really cool about the sake is once you open that sake, if you keep it in your refrigerator at a very cold temperature, it will stay fresh for many weeks. So unlike wine on your countertop, uh, which will fade and no longer be drinkable after say three days or so, maybe up to five days, depending on the wine, sake can last for many weeks in the refrigerator, which I really enjoy you can open up a very nice bottle and take little sips over a matter of several weeks and enjoy it. Um, again, keep the sake after it's been opened in the refrigerator. If you do decide to warm sake, it's best to warm it in a pan of hot water as opposed to the microwave. Um, I do think that the Uzumibashi uh, Kuro Tombo, the black dragonfly, the one sake that we have to wait patiently for it to arrive, uh, that is a sake that you could experiment with aging at home a little bit uh, because of the, uh, the acidity of that sake. Um, but uh, that would be sort of on you as a consumer to decide what you'd like to do. So, yeah. Okay, so the last thing. So we are in a social media and especially that the, my contact is the email and telephone number, I'm a local. And uh, please send me your email with, to my address. So I will you know, include your address to the, the Izumibashi or other sake event, the, the newsletter. And uh, Sarah, do you wanna mention about the company restaurants? Yeah, so um, one of the best news that I received just today in my Google feed is that Japan is finally opening up its doors to uh, visitors from outside of Japan. So COVID has made travel to Japan nearly impossible, even for Japanese uh, citizens. Uh, they are finally deciding to lift some of those restrictions. So we all have the opportunity to go and visit Japan again. And I highly recommend that you uh, put Izumibashi on your list. It's about an hour train ride outside of Tokyo. Uh, you can go, you can visit the brewery uh, and taste through and have an incredible experience at their restaurant uh, where you can try specially made foods uh, paired uh, specifically with sakes. Uh, it is definitely on my list for when I go back to Japan, so. Yeah, there is a, you know, company tours that the brewery tours, so you can book ahead and you can plan the weekend trip from Tokyo 
And uh, there is a, like the course menu at the restaurant and you will definitely going to enjoy with uh, you know, sake pairing experience in, in, uh, at the Izumibashi restaurant. And uh, I hope you, you are enjoyed it and uh, hope you will love the Izumibashi and the more sake is coming to US. And uh, hopefully that I can bring the Mr. Hashiba to the United States. So you are going to have the sake pairing dinner so thank you. Thank you so much. We wanted to give an opportunity if anybody had a question that they didn't uh, have a chance to ask. Um, obviously, I'm sure some of you um, have dinner to get to, so um, please don't feel obligated to stay on, but we are, well, we are happy to stay on for another few minutes. If you'd like to unmute, your, unmute yourself, maybe Kaio-san, we can take down the presentation and see everybody's faces. And if anybody wants to ask a question, we'll be happy to answer it for you. We hope you enjoyed it. Anybody? Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our pleasure. So we have a lot of comments in the chat, Kaiosan. Everybody's oh, very happy. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank so you. I have I have a question um, about the the koji. Is is the koji? kept in strains in the way that yeast is kept or is it is it like is it a house strain of koji that they keep and kind of propagate or is it just something that's naturally occurring everywhere and they don't sort of distinguish them or how does that work so there are three main types of koji that are used for um, making different types of alcoholic beverages in japan the main one here is a yellow koji called ki koji uh, and um, most producers purchase their koji um, from uh, the uh, Brewing Society in Japan. They do have different strains of Kikoji, but not quite the same number of strains that you might imagine with yeast. There's far more use of unique strains of yeast and house yeasts like you would see in a brewery. Um, koji itself is a little bit more homogeneous um, in sake production. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's perfect. Thank you. It's interesting, actually, because they can, they can they can choose to buy it in different ways. Um, you know, the koji, it's it basically, you know, koji has a life cycle like a mold uh, where it grows and then it goes to spore. And as I mentioned, they don't want it to go to spore. They don't want it to taste like mold when it grows on the rice. Um, but the koji that they buy is actual koji spores. So um, where they cultivate the koji, um, often it's co uh, either cultivated on rice, sometimes on barley grains. Um, they can choose to buy just the spores or they can actually buy little tins of the grains that have uh, of, of rice or often, as I said, barley that have this koji mold that's gone to spore. And they place uh, the koji in these little canisters uh, with a porous cloth on the top and they just tap it over the top of the steamed rice and it allows a little cloud of the koji spores to uh, sift over this bed of rice. Uh, and one of the most fascinating things I ever learned from uh, several tojis who've confirmed this is that for their highest grades of sake, their goal is to have about seven to 12 individual spores of koji per grain of rice. So if you can imagine worrying that much about every single grain of sand in your sand castle, that's the level of meticulous care that goes into sake production. So, I mean, as a, as a long time home brewer, I'm very much aware of how the yeast produces a lot of the flavors in beer. And so I'm imagining, and so the temperature also, the temperature formation also very much matters for that. Does it, does it also matter here, the temperature at which- the Yes fermentation is done, right? Tremendously. So the fermentation temperature is hugely important. And uh, it's also the temperature of the koji room itself is incredibly important right. uh, for the type of koji that you make. So koji is a frustrating word. So again, it's the name for the mold itself. We also shorten koji mai or koji rice being the rice that has the koji inoculated on it. Um, so we kind of use koji interchangeably for the mold itself and the rice um, that has had it grown on it. Um, but they're very cautious with the temperature um, because 
the type of diastic enzymes that are produced on the on this with this koji rice is also influenced by temperature. So when you want to have more um, protease, for instance, produce, um, they use uh, different temperatures. Uh, so you end up having more umami in the sake. Um, if they keep it very high temperatures, um, you get more uh, of the amino acids that just break down the starch into glucose. You have purer flavors. Um, the same thing is true that in the fermentation, this uh, uh, enzymes are more uh, activated by higher temperatures. I'm being a big nerd right now. I want to apologize to any of anybody who's still staying hanging in there with me right now. Um, but temperature wise, um, you know, enzymes are more active at higher temperatures than in lower temperatures. So by keeping the temperature very low, you actually are slowing down the sacrification. You're limiting the amount of glucose available to the yeast. You're then also stressing the yeast because they have colder temperatures and less uh, food. Um, the rice is melting less, so you have less nutrients to the yeast. And the stressed yeast create much more vibrant esters. So all of this comes together for producing these higher aromatic characteristics uh, in certain styles of sake. I just want to add something. It's not only the koji because how yeah. difficult is uh, at the sake brewery? The worker is spend so many efforts. Like you know, the koji koji room is a very high temperature to keep the, the koji mold to grow. So that the worker was wearing maybe some some people the Asian was they they are naked uh, the half of the you know your top uh, top body because so sweat and uh, moisture and but uh, for the east the 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 motto the and the east making that the the shubo making is very very cold temperature to start and then that the moromi and also cold and the, the sake pressing also cold so when i was there and uh, i have to keep that so many layer of the cold when because it's I see cold, and but they are using uh, so many that uh, by hand, and uh, it's a freezing that uh, you know cold temperature. But they have to stack that the uh, sake bag on the tuna box, and uh, so you will make that the uh, how hard that the uh, sake making because you have to be the certain that the uh, temperature controlled environment for the east and uh, also koji. Any other questions? Hi, so I, I realized that the, the black dragonfly is not available yet, but are the other three available at um, Calvert Woodley? Jackie? Ah, yes, <laughs> yes, they are. Um, the other three are available and they're on sale right now. Um, I will be sending you all a link to our website and the three sakis that we currently have, uh, and also this a recording of this uh, tasting will be up, and I'll send it out tomorrow as well. Yeah, and um, we're we're gonna send the updated presentation uh, in PDF form uh, to Jackie, so you guys can have these slides for your reference. Um, the only other question, I think we have very limited time left, but um, the there was a question about sort of how do you know which sake should be served warm or which sake should be served chilled? Uh, and I'll just mention here that um, some of this is very intensely personal. I think in the past, there were a lot of misunderstandings about sake, uh, that only poor quality sake would be served warm and only high quality sake would be served cold or things like that. Um, the truth is that you can um, sort of experiment and choose which temperatures are best. Generally speaking, uh, very high grade daiginjo sakes that have a lot of very strong, effusive uh, aromas uh, tend to do best served cold. When you warm them up, a lot of those uh, aromatic esters can sort of blow off and you stop getting the same enjoyment. Generally speaking, sakes that have more umami, more savory characteristics uh, really benefit from being served warm. Um, but ultimately, it really comes down to a matter of taste. And more and more, we're really trying to encourage people to experiment with your daiginjo, your high-grade sakes. Try them warm. You never know. They may be fantastic. Um, try uh, a 
a, a Junmai baseline type sake, cold, uh, and maybe it's a bit more crisp and refreshing. So sometimes it has to do with what you eat. So again, I think I mentioned the only really clear thing about sake we can say is that it's made from rice. There's no other really clear answers. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that will bring you back uh, to ask more questions in future, so. Thank you. Could I, just a quick, could you reiterate what the foods that you'd recommend with the, the, uh, the final one, the plum wine? Plum wine. The, or the, the yeah. ume in sake? Yeah, umeshu, umeshu. Uh, umeshu is a, the our umeshu is a not too sweet compared to other brewery. And so you can eat any kind of like the meat or cheese or even that the uh, uh, stir fry like uh, the vegetables and uh, you know, whatever that the, you are comfortable with, you know, there's a no barrier mm -hmm. or any uh, the law and the, whatever, you know, that the, the pairing is good thing is drink that the sake first, then that the have a, a lot of moisture. So mm -hmm. it's easy to detect all like sense of the umami, sweetness, mm -hmm. sourness, and then uh, the eat some, that, uh, some kind of food. And then you no know, drink that the, the sake, and you will change the, the character uh, character of the sake before uh, after, and uh, so um, that the umeshu, um, some like restaurant that the high end restaurant they use for the some like grilled duck, and uh, that grazing it the top of the you know chicken that the, the, the skins because have a very good sweet natural sweetness and sourness. And also um, that, uh, yeah, definitely like lamb or steaks and uh, that uh, I will try anything. Like, you know, that uh, even like, you know, you got the potato chips because that uh, the salt, salt is very good with the sweet. And uh, so combination and have the sourness from the, the ume and uh, you will enjoy it. <laughs> just, you know, just try it, just try it. <laughs> Thank you, kayo Yes, thank you so much. Sorry to cut in, but I we're about to we yeah. gotta finish wrap this up. But if anyone has any more questions, feel free to email them to me. Um, I'm the one who emailed you guys all about your um, up, uh, reminders for the tasting today. So I'm Jackie at CalvertWoodley.com. Feel free to email me any more questions you have, and I'll make sure to pass it along. Thank you so much to our hosts today, Kayoko and Sarah. You guys did an amazing job. Thank you so much for teaching us so much about. Saki, I cannot believe how much I didn't know prior to this. It was really interesting. Thank you so much. And we hope you all enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys.